people. Here we go. Some news headlines. Let's go. Hey, gun people. Well, let's get some updates, and I'm going to do a couple of uh, reports and the search warrant. Uh, so now we know that the coroner has confirmed that the death was a homicide and that um, they did confirm that it was Gabby, the body. Now, most people already knew that, but to make it official, you know, they could have used dental x-rays. They could have used all three or any fingerprints, dental x-rays, DNA. I mean, DNA would be pretty quick at return. I don't know how quick they can get a return on DNA now. Uh, but any of those things could have been used to do this. So what what does it mean by the coroner said it's a homicide, but the cause of death is unknown? So if we look at a state of Wyoming Department of Health certificate of death, it gives all the identifying information, date of birth, etc., marital status, uh, location, I think location about body, where was it found, etc. It goes down here and it has for cause of death, and it's pretty explicit. It says, enter the chain of events, disease, injuries, complications that directly cause the death. Okay. Uh, and you can put multiple ones. You can add more lines. And then if you go down here, was an autopsy confirmed? Did tobacco contribute? I don't know why the hell they want to do that. And if, if it's a female, which Gabby was, as far as we know, ain't no telling what some idiots out there are saying. Uh, they got to say whether she was pregnant, pregnant at the time of death, not pregnant but pregnant within 42 days of death, not pregnant, but pregnant 43 days in one year. I, I don't, I don't get all that, but the manner of death is what I, I wanted to get to here. So the, the coroner has these six options for manner of death, natural, accident, suicide, homicide, pending investigation could not be determined. The coroner has already made a choice here. He's already told us it's homicide. And homicide is normally death related by the person of another, not natural, whatever. So we know it's not natural. We know it's not an accident for all the people that kept saying, well, maybe she tripped and maybe she took too much drugs. We know it's not suicide. Uh, we know that the coroner didn't say, hmm, I'm not sure what the cause of death is because he would have put could not be determined. And he didn't say, well, I need to do a little bit more work. So it's pending. He has already chosen homicide. We call that a clue. The FBI released a press release, said, hey, the coroner did this. It confirmed by the date of birth and the manner of death is homicide. So let's review the report of the traffic stop. Since most people have seen the traffic stop and kind of know what happened there, if you haven't, I did a five-part video series, complete breakdown of the hour-long traffic stop. And there are five 30-minute parts on this traffic stop. So if you haven't watched that, you may or may not know. If you watch the video, you may know. But let's just look at the report that was filed. Now, this was the report that was filed from the police department. Uh, I'm not real sure who did it. It looks like the description of what they put on the report was disorderly conduct and the status was closed, meaning there's no further investigation. Um, let's see. Completed convenience store, disorderly conduct. Uh, white male, Brian Christopher Lawry. This Christopher was the witness that they called. Brian Christopher Lawry was one guy, or dirty laundry killer, and Gabby was the female. Okay, so we move down. It gives the information on the plate, and then it shows the incident. Time of occurrence, August 12th, 4.30 p.m. So... It starts out at 821, and I think the guy that's writing this report, it's really unclear because it says reporting officers, Pratt, Eric Robinson, Daniel, Scott. I don't even know who's writing this report, but from the way this guy's talking, it sounds like this is the bald guy that was kind of running around controlling the incident, even though it wasn't his incident. And I say that because he even says in here, I had to leave for another call, and he's the only one that left in the middle of the call. So I think this is his report. So uh, if you remember the bald officer with the badge, or, or not the badge, the beard, uh, that's who I'm talking about. That's who I think wrote the report, but I'm not sure. On so-and-so, officers were dispatched to report of a domestic problem that had taken place near the co-op, appeared male and female traveling north, van, ladder, blah, blah, blah. It was believed and reported the male had been observed to have assaulted the female. So they did know that the caller said the male reported the female. There was confusion on whether or not they knew. They did know that. 
I heard other officers report they were on the lookout for the vehicle. We usually call that a bolo, be on the lookout, B-O-L-O, -O, bolo, be on the lookout. Uh, so um, being that I had passed the Mayflower in order to get to Main Street, I stopped there to see if there was any witnesses in the area. That was a good move on his part. He's in the area. He's farther from where the car. We don't know where the car went. Let me try and get more info. So good for him. I found one identified as Chris. I took down his phone number and left the scene because I heard Officer Robbins tell dispatch he located the suspect vehicle near the park. Okay, again, good. He got the guy's phone number. I can call you later and get a witness. I've got an officer right now at a domestic, basically a domestic dispute by himself. I'm going to go to him and I'll contact you later. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of, I was kind of hard on the bald guy at the uh, scene, but it sounds like he's doing pretty good police work here, in my opinion. I heard him state that upon initial the traffic stop, he observed the vehicle leave the lane and strike the curb before hitting the near park entrance. The guy put that over the radio. The person just uh, struck the curb. I arrived on scene, and again, I think we're talking about the bald guy, and there was two park officers also arrived. So when he got there, there was three officers. I assisted Officer Robbins, so I'm assuming Officer Robbins was the primary there, with his investigation. I'm not sure you assisted him. I think you took over the investigation, but I'll let you say you assisted him in the report. Until I was called away to a report of intoxicated male posing a risk to his safety. So that's when he left. He got another call. Before leaving, so this is what he's saying he did when he was there. Let's see if this matches, because I haven't read this. Let's see if it matches what we saw in the video. I spoke with the male driver of the van, the female passenger of mine, and I also called Chris, who was the witness, to get more information from him. All three individuals gave me a similar and consistent story. I'm not sure if that's consistent, but okay. Consistence, consisting of the basic idea that the driver of the van, a male, had some sort of argument with the female, Gabby, as I recall. That's really bad to put a report, as I recall. You should know her name. You call the guy, you got a video. You're going to put, as I recall, that, I, I wouldn't put that in a report, but that, I mean, he's just writing it off the fly, I guess. The male tried to create distance. Oh, okay. He, he, he didn't start to fight and was dominating and stealing her phone and taking her keys. He tried to create distance by telling Gabby to take a walk and calm down. So he's telling her to create distance, take a walk, calm down, even though it's her van and even though he took her keys and I think her phone. But anyway, this officer felt that the poor male tried to create distance. The poor killer, the dirty laundry killer, tried to create distance. She didn't want to be separated from the male. Maybe she wanted her keys and her phone back. Maybe it appeared that she didn't want to be separated. Maybe she just wanted her keys and her phone. Maybe she was tired of being controlled. No, no, Rick. He wanted to create, okay, whatever. She didn't want to be separated from a male and began slapping him. He grabbed her face and pushed her back. When you grab someone's face, that is battery. When you push her, that is battery. This guy assaulted her. This officer is explaining as though he's the victim and he's protecting himself. When in fact, it's still battery. Even if he was protecting himself, it's still battery. He pushed her back and she pressed upon, as she pressed upon him and the van. He tried to lock her out. Yeah, that's not controlling. And succeeded except for his driver's door. She opened that and forced, 110 pounds, forced her way in on this male, the dirty laundry killer that has, has since killed her. She forced her way over him and made it into the vehicle before it drove off. Now that doesn't even make sense to even a reasonable person. You're telling me this guy is trying to tell her to stay out. He's trying to drive off. She has to force her way in before he can drive off and he still drives off after she forced her way in. I mean, this could be taken so many different ways. Was he kidnapping her? Maybe she was trying to stop him from driving off. Maybe she didn't want him to steal her car. Maybe she was trying to maintain possession of her vehicle. No, no. According to this officer, who assisted in the investigation, she climbed over him. She was the aggressor. No one reported the male struck the female. Uh, really? I'm pretty sure I heard in a 911 tape that he reported the male struck her. I'm pretty sure I heard that in a 911 tape. Both the male and the female reported they are in love and engaged to be married. 
and desperately didn't wish to see anyone charged with a crime. I kind of agree with that. They were both saying that. But a lot of domestic violence and domestic abuse victims do not want to press charges on their abuser because they know they will get more abuse when he gets out, when he's there. And they also know that they have no place to go or they feel they have no place to go or they don't want to leave them. So, you know, I mean, that that's why you're supposed to evaluate this and protect somebody against their own stupid decisions. However, I'm kind of anti-government. If two people don't want charges pressed and that's the way it ought to be, then I, I kind of think, you know what? Let them go. That's why I said I was okay with what the officers did. Uh, there was no significant injuries reported. Both agreed that Gabby suffers from serious anxiety. Both agreed. Really? Gabby was agreeing with anything not to get the, her abuser in trouble. Gabby would have said that he was the greatest guy in the world if she knew it wouldn't get him in trouble and wouldn't piss him off. But that's my opinion. I don't know that for sure. It appeared that the incident was more accurately categorized has a mental slash emotional health break than a domestic violence. Man, this guy's a psychologist. He's really trained. That's some pretty good words. This would be more accurately categorized. Has a mental and emotional health break rather than a domestic assault. Okay, great. Wonderful. I had to leave, but I understand that Officer Robbins, Robbins got the mail lodging through Sea Haven. I'm, I'm assuming... See, this guy, when you're writing a report, you should explain things like this. So when somebody like me or the court or a defense attorney or the jury hears this, we don't have to ask questions. What the hell is Seek Haven? I watched the video. As a cop, I'm pretty sure that Seek Haven is probably a domestic abuse uh, center that finds housing for people of domestic violence. I think that's what they are, but I'm not sure. I'm guessing. I shouldn't have to guess when I read a police report, but I digress. Gabby retained possession of the van. Actually, she was given the keys and told that she couldn't be around if she had no choice. They appeared to separate for the night. They didn't appear to separate for the night. They were ordered by a government agent that told them they had no choice, basically under threat that they would go to jail if they caught each other. They did not agree to separate for the night. This is, this is how reports are misrepresented. This is how people, when they read a report and take it on face value and say, well, the cops wouldn't lie. Well, is this cop lying? Is he being an idiot? Is he being deceptive or is he just writing things as he saw it or as he wants to see it? This is why you don't read a police report and take it as face value. But Rick, they're government and they're police and we should report, support them and they're all heroes. Okay, whatever. No charges were filed. No one wished for charges to be filed. Is that is that the way we charge files now? If we go to somebody and somebody is shot and they get up and they go, it's only a flesh wound. I'll just go to the hospital. I don't want charges. Is that how we work things now? Is that the new standard in Utah for filing criminal charges? All right. Look, I know I'm wish-washy here. I'm just telling you the complications and playing devil's advocate on what is too much government and what is not enough government. And when should government be held accountable and when should they not? And should we give them so much leeway that they can do anything they want, anytime they want, and we can't hold them accountable? Because I think that's where we're at. Anyway, no charges should be filed separation to take place although that was that was at minimum what officer robbins required in lieu of making a case against gabby for domestic assault what was that no charges were filed and no one wished for charges to be filed or for separation to take place if they didn't want it to take place why did it take place although that was at minimum what Officer Robbins required, how did he require it? Through law? Through his opinion? Through a court order? How did he require it? In lieu of making a case against Gaby. So why couldn't he make a case against the, the laundry killer? Why couldn't he make a case against Dirty Brian for domestic violence? No, no. Because they had already decided what they want. And that's the problem with law enforcement. Because when cops can decide this and can arrest who they want, they inconvenience. Look, I don't have a problem if cops do this and nobody's arrested. You you write your report and you refer to the DA and you say, you figure out who you want to charge. I don't like when cops get to pick on the scene. I'm going to charge you. I'm not going to charge you. I'm going to charge you. And I'm not going to charge you. And then there's no accountability on them. The DA has the final authority. Why, can't, why don't you just write a report and say, I'm going to refer to the DA. Here's what I know. 
Here's what I saw. Here's the witnesses. I don't know who to charge. I'm referring to the DA. Gabby, a 22-year-old female, was approximately 5'2", 5'4", 110, and 20. Why didn't you get her height and weight off her uh, driver's license instead of guessing and giving variances? While her fiancé is older, older, really? She's 22, he's 23. Why didn't you put he was 23? Why didn't you just say he's older to imply that he's really older? He's one year older, taller, and much heavier than her. He had no fear of his safety and did not exhibit any indicators that he may be a victim of battered boyfriend syndrome. Okay, I'm okay with that statement because I agree. I think that's correct. He wasn't in fear of his safety. He didn't want to press charges. And he could have got away or stopped her at any time. Who thinks, raise your hand if you think Gabby could have beat him up and killed him. Because Gabby's dead because he beat her up and killed her. Or we don't know yet. Oh, yeah, I forgot. She might have tripped and fell for you believers out there. He was assessed to be low risk of danger and harm as a result of his proximity to his fiance. If that's true, why did you separate him? If this statement is true and this is what you believe, why did you separate them? See, actions don't aren't consistent with what they did. All right, Robbins Daniel. So this is his report. Why didn't this guy? Oh, Mary Pratt. He did put his name. I'm sorry. I missed that when I was reading it. So Pratt, this is his statement. This is Daniel's statement. Good. Okay. Uh, on 821, approximately 1645, I responded to domestic uh, progress, a van with both male and female occupant were reported northbound, transit black ladder. I pulled him over. Christopher stated that Brian got into the van. Arguing, later identified Gabriel arguing over a phone. Was he arguing over a phone or was she trying to get her phone back that Dirty Brian took from her? See, again, how you word things matter. This isn't factually correct. Christopher stated that when Brian got into the van, he saw what appeared to him as Gabriel hitting Brian. Oh, so this must not be the caller. So they kind of pretty much ignored the 911 caller and only took this witness on scene. Gabriel hitting Brian in the arm and then climbing through the window of the van as if Brian, Brian had locked her out and she was trying to get in a van. I, actually, I think that's exactly what happened. I located a white van. Van matched the description. After they crossed the bridge, I was able to catch up with the van. I confirmed the license plate. I followed the van. Entered the gate national. I noted the van traveling approximately 45 miles per hour and 15 miles per hour. Okay, this is important, not so much for a speeding ticket, but for when people are arguing and excited and angry and emotional, they sometimes will drive fast and they aren't paying attention to the road. This would imply that he, that Dirty Brian was arguing and fighting with her. Now, of course, these cops that appear to be taking Brian's side may see this as poor Brian was defending himself. And while defending himself, he sped up. So see, let's, let's, I'll word it like these cops would read it. While Brian was driving, he was defending himself against an out of control OCD a uh, female passenger, Gabby, and while he was defending himself, he must have stepped on the accelerator a little bit and sped 45 miles an hour to 15. That's the way, I mean, this is why you don't start attaching and explaining things for what you necessarily want to portray or you want the event or confirmation bias. These officers have a lot of confirmation bias toward Brian. Okay, uh, let's see. After I activated my likes, I watched the van, double yellow line, Merged to two lanes and abruptly served right when the vehicle swerved. Both the front and rear passenger side wheels hit the curb a short distance before the entry to the gate. And the vehicle came to stop. I approached the vehicle, saw the occupant, Gabrielle, who was in the passenger seat, was crying uncontrollably. I asked Gabrielle to get out of the vehicle secretly. Gabrielle told me she was, suffers from, and they marked it out probably because of HIPAA. We can see the video where she says she's from ECD, but for some reason they marked it out in the thing. Suffers from OCD, blah, blah, blah. She continued because of her blank and blank combined with little arguments with Brian. Okay. She continued because. I have no idea what she continued. What did she continue? She continued crying. She continued suffering. What? Combined with a little argument she and Brian had been having all day. She was struggling with her mental health. Well, according to her, 
She was also struggling that I don't think you missed and which you didn't see with an abusive, controlling, domineering boyfriend that she was extremely fearful of and, and being controlled by, which I think you missed completely, but I digress. Which led to the incident being reported. Gabriel stated that when she saw my lights, she hit Brian in the arm to get his attention, which in turn caused him to hit the curb. Of course, she's going to take the blame. Um, while I was following him, I asked Gabriel if her intention was to hurt Brian. This is where we get into, I need to justify why I didn't arrest him, why I didn't do by, by, uh, charge them with domestic violence, because the domestic violence charge, evidently in Wyoming, says you have to hit somebody with the intent to hurt them. So I asked Gabriel, did she intend to hurt him? And Brian, her response was that she did not intend to hurt him. And I agree with that. You can punch somebody's arm and slap them and not intend to hurt them. It's to get their attention. I mean, hell, I slap women on the butt. I'm not trying to hurt them. You know, I, I mean, women slap me when I do something stupid or tell me I'm crazy. And we're laugh We're both laughing. So you don't have to slap somebody with the intent to hurt them. A lot of people are confusing. Like, what's the other reason you, of course, she intended to hurt him. I, I don't believe that, but whatever. Uh, let's see. Uh, I was following, but rather to get his attention, notice I was behind them with my lights as I pointed. At no point in my investigation did Gabriel stop crying, breathing heavily, or compose a sentence without needing to wipe away tears. Now, part of that could be she was nervous because the cops were there. And a lot of domestic violence victims and, uh, and people in abuse relationships don't like other people of authority there because they're afraid that they're going to make the situation worse or they're losing control, or they're separating them, and they, they uh, unfortunately, abuse people. Like I said, abused child will love and hang on to the abusing parent. You would think that if child was getting beat by, let's say, mom, it would hang on to dad, but it doesn't. It hangs on to the abuser. If a child is getting beat by dad, it hangs on to dad, not mom, because it would rather hang on to the person to stop them from beating him than hang on to the person that might give them love. So, uh, this doesn't surprise me that she was totally upset because she was separated. She didn't know what to say. She was afraid to make a mistake. She was afraid to do something wrong. She was afraid that no matter what she said, she was going to piss her abusing boyfriend off. That's the mindset of people in abuse relationships. All right. Compose the sentence without needing to wipe her tears, wipe her nose, or rub her eyes and hands. Uh, let's see. As I sat Gabriel on the back seat of my car, I asked Brian to step out of the vehicle. He told me they both suffer from... OCD, mental health, whatever. Also, her blank is more advanced than his. OCD, probably. Issues between the two of them have been building over the last few days. This is a key statement that this is ongoing violence. This is ongoing frustration. Something else is going on more. This is not... Now, remember, when they were talking on scene, I didn't hear all this. And now I'm hearing what's in the mind of these cops. And that's why I'm adding other things that would lead me to concern if I believe what these cops are writing in this report. So when I hear something's been going on, an argument's been going on for three days, this isn't a, a, a isolated incident. This isn't a, you know, just something that just happened. This isn't over a phone. This isn't over something that, that one thing. This is probably a serious ongoing domestic situation that may or may not need intervention, that may or may not need help, that may or not need, you know, and again, on domestic calls sometimes, I will ask, is there a friend that can come get you? Can I call somebody? Who's your support? Who do you talk to? Who would you like to talk to the most about this incident besides me? And if they say, my friend, my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, I'll say, how about I call them and let you talk to them? Because when I let someone talk to somebody they're comfortable with, they're going to say things that they may not say to me, and that's going to help my investigation. So when you're at a domestic, if you can get them talking, your goal is to get information. How can I gather information? I want to gather it any way I can. Therefore, that's one technique that I would use not only to get information, but maybe I would just say, look, I'm going to go talk to him. Why don't you call somebody and get a support? Maybe that person that gives them support mechanism will say, We'll convince them, you need to tell the cops the truth. You need to get away. I'll come get you. Don't put up with this. I told you this was going to happen. Then I may get another witness and I'll go, did you talk to him? Are you okay? Do you mind if I talk to him? And then I'll take the phone or if I'm letting him use my phone, I'll say, do you mind if I talk to him? 
and then I will get a third person's report who's more close to this than I am, who has a lot more information, who has a lot more history, and I may find out, hey, he's been arrested three times. She should have called the cops many times. I've taken her to the doctor before. She needs to get out of this. This, this would make so much better for me to make a good decision on whether or not to get involved or not. These cops didn't have the experience, the knowledge, whatever, training, whatever. I, they didn't do what I can, like I said, what I would have done when I see somebody in this woman's type situation. I'm not saying they were wrong for not, and they could have prevented this, because no matter what they did, my, the odds are she would have went back with them. But that doesn't alleviate the responsibility to do something to try and intervene and get this poor girl help, because abusers, they need help. Unfortunately, they make bad decisions. They're in this relationship and they can't get out and they feel like there's no way out and they feel like they can't get help. So sometimes they need intervention. So, all right, here we go. But Rick, you always say government should stay out. Uh, I, I do say government should stay out and I don't like government intervention and force. But I also don't think that government shouldn't be able to help somebody because they have resources and try and help. All right, let's see. Uh, Gabriel and him have been, try uh, let's see, uh, cause the argument. Brian told me neither Gabriel or him take their medication, take medication for their things. Brian explained Gabriel has been traveling together for four or five months. The time spent created emotional strain between them and increased their number of arguments. Man, Brian's got all the great answers and great ex Brian is the freaking expert on this relationship. Brian is the guy who I want to get all my information from because he's got the best answers. I'm being facetious, people. This, this is what we call a clue in the investigative world that why is this guy so smart, yet he's in a relationship for four or five months that's arguing? If he's so freaking smart, why is this going on? Okay, all right. The time spent creating most strength. Um, while arguing near Main Street, man, I'm already at 30 minutes. Holy shit, I'm going to have to do another one on the warrant. Okay, while arguing at Main Street, he attempted to separate her so they could both Calm their emotions. Oh, man, Brian. Dirty Brian's such a good guy. He's really in control, and he's thinking clearly, and he's the smart one of the two. How about he's the controlling one of the two? He's the one that gets to make all the decisions. He's making all the decisions, and this poor girl is being victimized and abused by him. How about that has an alternative view for one of you freaking meathead two brain cell cops out there that, oh, jeez. So, so see, now you can see I'm getting more wired up as I'm reading this because it's like, really? None of you guys saw through this freaking Dirty Brian shit? All right. He attempted to separate. Oh, what a good boy. Her. So they could calm down. I'm thinking of, uh, so they could calm their emotions. Oh, so they could calm their emotions. Oh, so he was emotional too, but he had the knowledge to know that we should separate. Okay. He got into the van. Oh, isn't that nice of him? He, he forced his way in a van because he was stronger. He had the keys. He took her phone, and she didn't have a choice. He didn't just get in the van. Gabriel had gone into a manic state. Who says? He said or the cops said? Who is diagnosing this one? Everybody's diagnosing Gabriel, and nobody's diagnosing Dirty Brian. Why is that? Brian said Gabriel thinking he was going to leave her. Why would she think that? Did you say that? It, why didn't you ask her? I didn't hear anybody ask her. Did you think he was going to leave and take your van? Why, why did you jump through the window? These cops knew all this, and I didn't see any of these questions being asked on the scene in a video I saw. Nobody asked her, why were you chasing him? Why did you push him? Why did he put her hands on the face? Why did you feel like you had to climb through? Why did he race off after you climbed through the window? I didn't hear any of these freaking questions in the tape. I mean, but now I'm getting all this new information as I read the report. Freaking crazy. All right. Uh, he got in a van manic state, uh, thinking he was going to leave her in, and without a ride, went to slap him. Has Gabriel started to swing? Poor Brian. Brian pushed her away to defend himself from this violent attacking 110 pound woman that he's been abusing. Jesus Christ. He pushed her away to avoid the slap. As a revolt, as a result, Gabriel off balance. As a result, Gabriel off balance, but still caught Brian's face with some fingers causing minor visible scratches. Brian continued 
Brian continued that when he had seen my lights, he thought Gabriel had grabbed the wheel of the van and pulled it. Man, causing the van to hit the curb. I observed some... See, when you have to slow down and read word for word, it's not written well. It doesn't flow. I observed some small scratches to Brian's right arm, and when I asked him about them, he supposed he supposed they must have happened when Gabriel was trying to get his attention about me being behind them with my lights on. This, however, was not consistent with Gabriel's statement, further suggesting her... Oh my God, dude! So she's confused and emotional, but but his statement is all correct. So so let me let me get this straight. In, in Utah's police academy, if you have two people at a domestic violent and one's crying and the other one isn't, the one not crying is the one you should listen to, and the one crying further suggests that her confused emotional state is she doesn't know what she's talking about. Are you freaking kidding me? I mean. Look, people, I know people are going to be like, Rick, you're just picking on the cop and you think you're perfect. And whatever, man. I'm sorry. I, I'm just looking at this going, what the hell are these cops doing? After evaluating the totality of circumstances, legal term to sound good. To, so when you get into court, you can use the same terms that the Supreme Court uses. Therefore, you must be right, right? Because if you use the same terms, you must be doing it right. I do not believe the situation escalated to the level of domestic assault. Really? I think 99% of the people would have thought this did meet domestic assault. I still don't, not, don't think they're wrong for not arresting him because neither one was press charges. But to me, there was an assault, there was contact, there was pushing, there was shoving, there was erratic driving, there was climbing through windows, there was taking phones and taking keys, and one person is bleeding. Now, call me a skeptic, but to me, that's a freaking domestic violence assault. I'm sorry. Rick, you're just being mean to the police. It's not fair. You just hate them. All right, whatever. Uh, assault has much as a mental health crisis. Then why didn't you call a mental health professional? Why didn't you take them into protective custody and cause them to be evaluated? If you keep saying it was a... See, they're using the term mental health crisis as a way to get out of the criminal incident. I don't have to make criminal charges. If I can say there wasn't a criminal, I think it was just mental health. Well, if it was mental health, why the hell didn't you do some sort of checklist or take someone into protective custody because they had a mental health issue and they need intervention from a mental health professional, not you on the side of the road diagnosing them as emotional and confused? How about that? Rick, why are you picking on the cops? I thought I thought police stick together in the blue. Shut up, you freaking idiot. I then determined the most appropriate course of action, great, would be to help separate the parties for the night. You didn't help. You ordered it. You abused your position. You did something you had no authority to do. And instead of doing something you had authority to do, like get a professional there, you didn't do that. Instead of arresting someone for a criminal charge, you didn't do that. But what did you do? You made up some freaking separation law order that you told them they couldn't do it or they'd be arrested and you forced it and you sent a woman off in a van that she wouldn't used to drive in in a strange place by herself. And then you took the man into a hotel and got him a room for the night. That was your brilliant brainchild choice. Dude, I'm not impressed. The more I read this, the more I'd be writing people up and chewing people out if I was freaking involved in the disciplinary on this case. Okay, so they could not reset. So, oh, so they could reset their mental state. Man, this guy uses good words. He's got them resetting their mental state, confused. Uh, you know, emotional health crisis. Man, he's got some good words. He writes really good. Too bad he fucking doesn't do... Oh, shit, I said F. I'm trying to calm down. Too bad he can't do his damn job out there and get the freaking woman that's emotional mental health help. All right. They both ultimately agreed to be separated. No, they didn't. You told them to. Accordingly, I was able to contact Safe Haven. Again, the Safe Haven one word or two wrote because the other guy wrote his one word. This guy wrote it as two words. Now I don't even know how to freaking place to check it down to find out what it is. And get Brian a hotel room for the night. I instructed both Brian and Gabriel to take advantage of this time apart and relax. Oh, man, this guy's a counselor. This guy's like Dr. Phil and shit. He should have his own show. Let's start the Utah Police 
a mental health show because we're going to help you. He instructed Brian and Gabriel to take advantage of this time apart to relax their emotions and to regain control of their anxiety. Damn, are you freaking kidding me, dude? I also asked them to avoid contact. You didn't ask, you ordered them to avoid contact with each other until the next morning. You told them they couldn't be together. You actually sent a woman out on her honor, 22-year-old woman, in a state that you described as confused and emotional state. You sent her out by herself in a van that she said she wasn't used to driving in a strange area that they were on a trip. You didn't contact a friend. You didn't contact some, You didn't do any. You sent her out by herself. Dude, I'm sorry. The more I read this, the more it pisses me off. Gabriel maintained possession of the white van. I transported Brian to a hotel. They both did their own cell phones in case they both have their own cell phones. Somewhere there's confusion about whether Brian has a cell phone, whether he didn't have a cell phone or whatever. So the guy don't like plastic because he can't drink out of it because it's going to ruin the world or whatever. But he's okay with having a plastic cell phone with computer chips, etc. Really? So whatever. The, the, this whole case is just a, a, a comedy of errors. At 1900 hours, I went to Blank, where Christopher Blank lived. This is the witness. Had him fill out a statement uh, form. Christopher told me that he was not entirely sure what he had seen. Really? The other guy seemed like he was perfectly clear. And he was perfectly 100% sure that the poor Brian, dirty Brian, was the victim and Gabriel was the aggressor. And now he's saying he's not sure what he had seen? Man, you, you two idiots can't even get your two statements together because both of you are saying something different. Jesus Christ. All right. Christopher told me uh, he was not entirely sure what it was that he had seen, but feared the worst. Okay. So now we have thing. He, the thing. The Christopher only saw one part. He didn't have any of this information, and he didn't talk to him, and Christopher has better gut feelings than these two freaking trained cops. Are you kidding me? but feared the worst, which is why he came forward as a witness. Christopher Price feels like shit because he didn't do more. The statement from Christopher has been filed with the police department. Okay, and uh, then we have this information. So I'm at 37 minutes, and I only went over the incident at the uh, at the van. So uh, sorry I went so long. Uh, my next video will be on the search warrant, and it's not the search warrant for the house. If anybody knows, you can get me a copy of a search warrant, a house, a link, whatever, put it in the comments. Uh, even if you put it in there, it'll go to spam and I can find it and I'll check my, the, the spam, the link comments. Uh, but I need a copy of the search warrant they did for the house. This is a search warrant they did for the computer and I'll do that in a different video. All right, well then that there.